Who thinks Usman did a good job reading all those names? <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for reading, Usman, and, and thanks for the reminder, Adit, for us to, uh, to come to church, to listen and, and be part of the service, not just as recipients, but we're actually really all involved in each other's lives, um, in the way we speak and, and love each other today. So, um, and hopefully we'll be able to somewhat see that even from this passage as we come to think about the way God relates to us. Uh, recently there was a, some really great news from a brother and sister at Kingsway. They, they go to um, the evening service um, and I think it's appropriate to share. I got their permission to share this. Uh, Theo and Priscilla, if you know who they are, they recently got engaged. And, I, um, and, and so if you know who they are and if you bump into them, or you know, make sure you say congratulations. I heard, I heard all about the proposal, and it was a really, really wonderful proposal. I heard all about the effort and love that Theo put into, into the event. Uh, the only problem with the proposal is that Theo has set this really high bar for the other guys at, in the evening service now. Um, and it made me think back on my own proposal to Angelina. And, and it made me realize what a real man of the people I am in setting a very low bar for what a proposal should be. <laughs> the other day, I told Angelina about Theo and about Priscilla, and like, you know, they got engaged, and um, I told them about the proposal, and she said, yeah, yeah, that's nice. She paused, and she said, I want to get married again. <laughs> and, I, and I said, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I know my proposal was a bit of a flop compared to Theo, but, you know, we have a baby together, <laughs> you know. Um, now, what do you mean you want to get married again? And uh, thankfully, she just meant she wanted to like relive the experience, you know, the, the feeling and joy of being married. Not that she wanted to get married again to someone else. Um, no, and she, she, and she says this quite often. She, she, she really likes weddings because um, she, it's su such a special occasion of, of two people being affirmed in their love for each other. Um, yeah, it's special, and, and some of us um, is here in the morning have uh, probably, um, ma some of us may have been married for longer than Angelina and I have, and um, you might have had a time in your relationships when your romantic sort of juices ran low, uh, or maybe it's been running low for, lo for many years, or maybe it's long gone. <laughs> um, but there can still be special moments I think, a, as a married couple, or re really any relationship, even between friends, when once in a while we reaffirm our, our love and commitment for the other person or, we, or, or, or the other person's love and commitment to us is reaffirmed. And that's really special, right? That, that's, that, that's, that's nice, that's good. And you know, we hear people do things like renew their vows, and, and I'm sure there's lots of other thoughtful things we can do, but when, when, when those promises of love and commitment uh, are revisited or, or reaffirmed and reiterated, those, that event can help rejuvenate and refresh us in our relationships. It, it, it helps us to relive that joy and assurance that we might have first felt, and, that, and I think that's what this chapter is about. God reaffirms his promise to Jacob, and in doing so, he rejuvenates Jacob's faith despite the difficult circumstance that Jacob finds himself in. Uh, and, and, and as we look at this story, we're going to see how the chapter uses references to past places and past things that God has said, past stories, and, and it keeps doing that to bring us back into the, 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 the fuller story, the, the fact that this part of Jacob's life is actually a, a continuation, that there's, there's just this underlying theme of the, the fact that God's ongoing, unwavering commitment and faithfulness to his promises are, are something that Jacob should realize. Uh, even, even through all of the ups and downs of Jacob's life, God is reminding him that he hasn't changed, that he's been with Jacob, and therefore he will continue to be with Jacob. 
and, and really if we sort of zoom out even more, actually that's the continuation of the promise of God, not just to Jacob, but to Isaac and Abraham, even to Noah and even to Adam and Eve when he said he's going to send someone to crush the serpent's head and, and that sort of gospel promise is continued all throughout Genesis and it's even reached us today as well. And so hopefully um, by the end of this we'll, we'll also feel reassured and reaffirmed in God's love and commitment and faithfulness to us because God is going to reaffirm His promise to us in our fears and our worries and tell us of His presence with us in our circumstances. And we're going to do this, so we're going to look at the chapter through two main sections, refreshed in God's promise and reunited in God's providence. Oscar, if you might just help me because my phone's not working today. Let's pray. Father, as we come to your uh, word in Genesis chapter 46 and just tracing through um, what you say to Jacob in his moment of fear as he's going down to Egypt, um, the way that you reassure him and reaffirm him in your promises and, and you show him your grace, uh, help us to see that you're doing the same for us today. In the gospel, you reaffirm us that you really are with us to the very end of the age. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so we've spent a couple weeks looking through Joseph's story in the book of Genesis. But even though we've called it Joseph's story, really Joseph's story is just a side story to the, to the bigger story of Jacob's story. Now, Joseph's story, we didn't really hear about Jacob a lot in Joseph's story, but it, Joseph's story was meant to um, just help us give, help give some background to what God was really doing in terms of Jacob's story. Um, because the bigger story of Genesis is following God's promises to Israel and how, it, how God is going to make Israel into a great nation and bless the world through, through them. And so when Joseph gets sold as a slave and he becomes you know, the ruler of Egypt, the whole point of that is that it's created the scenario and the opportunity for Jacob's family to come into Egypt and to become a great nation in Egypt. They, they, and Jacob has heard the good news that Joseph is alive. Uh, he packs his things and, and they start moving to Egypt. And we're told that on the way to Egypt, Jacob stops at a place called Beersheba and he worships God there. Now, places and names in the Bible are really important. They give us clues to understanding what's going on in the story. Uh, Beersheba was a place that marked the border of the land that Jacob currently lived in. He lived in the land of Canaan. That was the land that God had promised to Jacob and his family and his descendants. I'm going to give you a land and, and, and you're, going to have a, you're going to be a great nation in that land. It was a promise of blessing. And so he, he's moving from this land into Egypt and Beersheba is at the border. It's the southern border of the land. So meaning passing Beersheba would be leaving the land that God had promised to him and his grandparents and his children. It's like, I don't know if you remember in Lord of the Rings, the first movie, The Fellowship of the Ring, Frodo and Sam, they start like setting off on their mission and they're running across the fields and Sam suddenly stops, you know, he freezes um, and, and, he say, and, and Frodo's like, what's wrong, Sam? And he says, oh, Mr. Frodo, <laughs> one more step, and it's the furthest I've been from home. Uh, one more step, and, and there's no turning back from the mission of you know, going and taking this ring. It's the final crossing for Jacob to leave behind God's land of promise and go into a foreign land. That's a massive, massive step for Jacob to take because we remember Jacob had actually only come back to the land of Canaan after going through lots and lots of difficulties. He, was, he, he thought he might never even return to this land. Um, he had to face his biggest fear of, of his brother who was out to kill him. And now he has to leave it again. So it would have been an overwhelming thought for Jacob to think that he'd he'd have to live and possibly even end up dying outside this land of Canaan, outside the land of God's promise. 
to leave it all behind and go to Egypt of all places. And Jacob's obviously worried and afraid. And so, and so at the same time, so Bathsheba has that significance of location in, in the border, but there's a real spiritual significance to this place as well because his grandfather Abraham had worshipped God here. Isaac had worshipped God here. And, and if we look at what God said to Isaac, when, when Isaac worshipped God here, this is what God said to Isaac in chapter 26. God had said to Isaac, Isaac, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and will increase the number of your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. And if we read what God says to Jacob in Bathsheba in today's chapter 46, he says, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt. I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down to Egypt with you, and I will surely bring you back again in Joseph's own hand. We'll close your eyes. Do you see, pretty much, it's almost the exact same promise. God is reiterating and refreshing the promise that has been the same for Jacob, for Isaac, for Abraham, and he's doing it all over again. I want us to see that there are four things here in the way that God reassures Jacob that tells us of who God is and how committed God is to his promises and plans. He tells Jacob, I'm going to make you into a great nation there. It, it's a repeating of the promise, Abraham's promise in chapter 12. God's plans haven't changed. And then he says, I myself will go down to Egypt with you. This is also a repetition of a promise when Jacob had a vision of the staircase and God said, look, I'm never going to leave you until, uh, until I've done what I've promised you. I will not leave you. I will watch over you wherever you will go. And if we really think about the spiritual significance of what's happening here, if we think about, okay, Jacob is leaving the land of promise. He's afraid that when he leaves the land of promise, he's leaving God's blessing. He's leaving God's land of blessing. Back in those days, um, it was normal when, you, when, when anyone worshipped a god, it was normal to think that the god's power, uh, sphere of influence was limited to the land that the people that worshipped that god lived in. So if, if, you, if you're an Egyptian and you worshipped gods of Egypt, they were the gods over Egypt. You, when you leave Egypt, they're not the gods anymore. The, the gods had territories. Uh, if, you, if you worship the god of Babylon, it was the same thing. You were the god over Babylon. You leave Babylon, whatever. And we see it today as well. I mean, I mean if you say, look, oh, there's a god of this mountain. Uh, there's a shrine in this mountain. He's the god of the mountain. You leave the mountain. Okay, well, there's another god. He's god of the river or, or whatever it is. They don't have power. Uh, that's how most religions operate when we have multiple gods, but what does God say? God says, hey, I'm the God over here. You go to Egypt, I'm still God. I'm going to be with you wherever you go. And um, that's important for us as well because that's sometimes how we think. God is God over there. You know, God is God over there in the land of promise, in the good times, uh, in the places where I feel comfortable and safe. But God can't be God over there because I'm, I'm uncomfortable and I feel unsafe and, and life isn't as good. And God says to that, no, I'm God over here, I'm God over there. And then he says, I'm surely going to bring you back again. And once again, this is another commitment to a promise that he already gave in chapter 15 of Genesis. Abra God says to Abraham, look, a time is coming um, for 400 years, your descendants are going to be in a country that's not their own. They're going to be enslaved and mistreated, but I'm going to bring them out. And I'm going to bring them out into the promised land again. So once again, God is reassuring Jacob through the fact that everything that happens is under my sovereign control, even you going into Egypt. Um, 
at the final little thing that, that um, God says, is he, he tells Jacob that Joseph's own hand is going to close your eyes, which is a very tender and personal comfort for Jacob because his whole life he's been like, I lost Joseph. I'll never see Joseph again. I'm going to die without Joseph. And God gives him a little personal comfort that, that he'll be with Joseph as he dies. So with all these, I think there's something for us to think about. Um, if you ever feel like you're stuck as a Christian, um, you're not feeling right, there's worry and anxiety and fear in your life. Your faith is weak. Maybe, like Jacob, there's a growing sense of drifting away from God, feeling far from God. That if I just, if something, if this changes in my life, or if I don't have this, if I don't have this person, or if I don't have, uh, have this event in my life, I'm just going to feel like God isn't with me then really what the Bible is saying to us today is that what we need in our times of worry and anxiety and fear, when our faith is weak, when we do feel like we're drifting away and we're far from God, what we need, first and foremost, is God's Word, God's promises, repeated and reminded to us. We need to soak in God's promises of grace and light and love. God tells Jacob, hey, I'm God. I'm, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he says, he's our God today as well. He's the same God that was the God of Jacob. He's the same God that's the God of us. We need, like Jacob, to pause and worship God. We call upon his name. We need to read and hear and meditate on the revelation of God. God reveals himself, reveals his heart for sinners in the Bible. He pours out his heart for us. He shows us himself in Jesus. You know, if you need your faith rekindled or refreshed, if you need your family to be reoriented, there's only one place that you can look. There's only one place that you must look. We need this for ourselves we need this for each other. Ephesians 5 tell us, tells us to be filled with the Spirit, to speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. We need the repetition and reaffirmation of God's Word, the promises of the Gospel that tells us, do not be afraid. I'm going with you, and I'm going to bring you back to me. Whatever you're going through, I'm going to always bring you back to me. The, doing this, repeating the gospel to ourselves and to each other every single day is the basis of genuine Christian faith. It's the basis of genuine Christian fellowship. It's the basis of genuine Christian friendship, genuine Christian marriage. It's, it's the very basis of how we encourage each other. It's the very basis of how we correct each other. It's the very basis of how we forgive each other. It's the very basis of how we come to repent of ourselves. It's the very basis of how we build each other up. It's the very basis of what we do as a church. And it's the very basis of how we pray. It's just the very basis of every single thing that we do is to point and to come back God's promises to us in the gospel. Who is he? Who does he show himself to be? He says, I'm the God of your fathers. I, I haven't changed. I'm the God who's God everywhere. God always brings us back to what he has said. Because through what he has said, we learn who he is. And when we learn who he is, we have confidence in what he has done, what he is doing, and what he's going to do. Now, Oswald Chambers uh, he's a Christian man. He said, the remarkable, th remarkable thing about God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. Now, God's promise is not that He goes before us and He's going to be with us on the road of prosperity and blessing. 
you know, he's telling Jacob that he's going to be with Jacob on the road of uncertainty, on the road of discomfort, on the road of unfamiliarity, on the road of trials, the road of fear. But God says, don't be afraid. I'm fulfilling my promise. I- I'm going to bring you into the fullness of my salvation, into the fullness of knowing me. I'm going to be with you every step of the way. Now, I-, I think this could be a refreshing reassurance of God's promises to us. We're on that same road as Jacob. As Jacob. Our ultimate promise of a home, of family, of the blessing of peace and eternal life is not found in this world. It's found in the world to come. It's not found in ourselves. It's not found in in where we live. It's not found in the achievement of our personal goals and happiness. It's not found in what job we have. It's found in Jesus. It's found in His glory. and, And God says, the fullness of that glory of Jesus is yet to be revealed. But he promises he's going to bring us into it. And and God says, until then, in all the ups and downs of life, he's with us. He's bringing us into the greatness of his salvation, his big family, his great blessing. Um, and, And there are some things that God does for Jacob as they go into Egypt. God doesn't just say, hey, believe in me, boom. (laughs) <laughs> you know, like, see you later, just believe in me. Um, I want to point you to three things that, that God does for Jacob to continue to remind Jacob that he is really with him. He, he's not just saying it, he really is with him through his time in Egypt. The first thing he does is, um, he, so he provides for Jacob and his family. The first thing he does is he, he loves Israel. He shows Israel that he loves them and in the bigger picture, we, we, so I'm not going to read it because Rusman did a better job than me. I'm not going to read all the names. But Jacob takes 70 people from his family down to Egypt. Uh, and, and experts say that's probably not like a literal number. It probably was above or below 70. But 70 is a symbolic number. The Bible often uses the number 7 to, to sort of convey a sense of totality or fullness, meaning 70 is conveying that Jacob took everything. Jacob responded in faith. Jacob took everything, the totality of his family, the totality of his life, with him down to Egypt, as according to what God had told him. He left nothing behind. And side side note, obviously, that's God's call in our lives as well. Total faith, um, total trust. He wants all of us, our heart, soul, mind, and strength. He wants, you know, and you know, when um, Adi was talking about, look, you know, support the work of the gospel. Um, partner with us and and so we 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 tend to it's very easy to separate church and money but actually god doesn't just want your tithes or your 10 percent or whatever it is that people might say god actually wants everything that doesn't mean give all your money to the church but it means that's the mindset we have god wants everything he wants our whole bank account he wants our whole heart He wants our whole lives, he wants every second of every moment to be his. And that's what Jacob's doing. He takes 70, the whole of his life, the whole of his family, down to Egypt. But it also tells us, in a more sort of practical sense, 70 is not a big number. Because we could, I mean, yeah, he could have said, hey, Jacob took 700. Oh, that's a decent number, but he takes 70, it's not a big number, it's a big family, but it's not a big number when we, we're thinking in the picture of, well, God wants to make Jacob into a great nation. 70 is probably us sitting here, we're not a great nation, we're a decent sized church, but we're not a great nation. And so, later on, when God fulfills his promise, he takes this massive group of people. One day they're going to become a massive group of people, a great nation. 400 years later, he takes them out of Egypt, out of slavery. And, and he says to them, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, he says to them, 
I want you to remember that I didn't choose you to be my treasured possession, to be my people because you were more numerous than other people. I, I didn't choose you because you had potential to be great. I didn't choose you because you had a big family already. I, you were the fewest of all peoples. And then he says, it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out of Egypt. Know that your Lord, that the Lord your God is God. He's the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. Now, if we reword what God is saying to the Israelites in Deuteronomy chapter 7, to us today, God is saying, God has chosen you and me to be his people, his treasured possession, but he didn't do it because we're great. He didn't do it because we were many. He didn't do it because we had a lot to offer him. He didn't do it because we had something for him to work with. He didn't do it because we were righteous or wise or more commendable than anyone else. He did it because he loved you. And he did it because he's a faithful God who keeps his covenant. That's a wonderful encouragement. Secondly, God provides a home for Jacob and his family in Egypt. They settle in a place called Goshen, and um, commentators say that this was a genius move by God because um, the Egyptians were sort of like these modern people. They were the modern people of their time. They liked their cities. They liked to live in cities. They were refined, sensible people who had houses and roofs um, and hieroglyphs and fun funky hats and funky dances, and they grew crops in and, and, so, and they grew crops in designated fields. That was one of their things. Hey, uh, we grow crops in the same place every year. Which means they thought that people who had animals and had to move around to find grass, and hey, look, today you're sleeping outside because there's no grass here, and you have to sleep. They thought that that was like a really backward and crude and old way of life. It's kind of like if you've ever been to Korea or Japan and you use a bidet and you come to Australia and you actually have to wipe your own bum and for a week you're just sitting there knowing that everyone is coming out of the toilet, trusting in a piece of toilet paper in their hand to have done a good enough job and you're thinking to yourself, these filthy animals are <laughs> living in a filthy... <laughs> Australia is filthy. I got carried away there. But because of all that, they're settling in Goshen. They're a good distance away from the heart of Egyptian civilization because the Egyptians think, okay, no, these people are filthy. They, they, they don't live in houses. They're not living in houses. They're living in tents. Um, they're moving around with their animals. And God, God gives them space and land to grow as a people. In, in other words, God provides safety. God provides for them a temporal home. In the midst of Jacob's fear, God gives them a place of refuge. And God does the same for us. The Bible tells us we're exiles in the world. We don't belong here, the Bible actually tells us. The Bible says our true home isn't on this world, but it's in heaven. And yet we can find refuge in the world. Not by being like the world, but we can find refuge in all of our discomforts and difficulties and sufferings and worries and anxieties in all of the burdens that come with living as sinful people in a sinful world, we can find refuge in God who is with us. And if we can find refuge in God who is with us, that also means we can find refuge in God's people, in other people who are also exiles. We're being built into God's temple together. We're members of one body. We are all going through the same thing. Third thing, third and last thing. God graciously, graciously provides a reunion with Joseph. The interesting thing about this is that um, we're told that you know, Joseph came in his chariot and um, he, he appeared before his dad. And, um, and the phrasing is, Joseph appeared before him. And that phrase is often used in other parts of the Bible to describe how God appears to men, to people. 
In other words, the reunion between Joseph and Jacob is like this picture of an overwhelmingly powerful, um, majestic ruler, you know, royalty, dressed in his perfectly white clothes, surrounded by his multitude of servants and soldiers, and he's coming down off his chariot, off his throne, off his seat, and embracing this dirty, hungry, old, nomadic, backwards old man because he loves him. And then Jacob says, look, now that that's happened for me, I'm ready to die. And in the New Testament, a man named Simeon holds baby Jesus and he says, now that I've seen Jesus, I can die in peace. My eyes have seen your salvation. Now Jacob beholds his son, the ruler of Egypt, his temporal saviour, who can give him some land and some food. Simeon beholds the son of God, the king of the universe, his eternal saviour. You know, the gospel tells us the ultimate safety, the ultimate refuge, and, uh, the ultimate evidence of God's faithfulness in the midst of our fears is that he unites us with his son, Jesus Christ. God is with Jacob in Egypt. He's united with Joseph. God is with us today, tomorrow, and forever. And we know that because he's united us with Jesus, his son. I want to re- end by reading a psalm, and I'm going to actually read this psalm as, as our prayer, and so you can close your eyes. And I, and I want this to be our prayer this morning for us to be reassured in the knowledge that our God really is with us in Jesus in all the difficulties and the ups and downs of our lives. This is Psalm 121. Please cor- close your eyes, and I'll end with using this psalm as a bit of a prayer. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Amen.